So if you didn't want to sit through my extremely long video where I shared every single thought that I had on seahorse keeping, we're now going to do a shortened version for those of you that already know saltwater and just want to know how to keep these guys happy and healthy. With all the tanks out there, it's hard to know which tank would work best for seahorses. Well, most of the tanks out there will work. The guideline for a seahorse tank is actually just to make sure that it's over 30 gallons per pair of seahorses. I'm sure most of you have heard that before, but I'm going to tell you why. The reason that you want at least 30 gallons per pair of seahorses is for a couple of different reasons. First of all, until you've actually kept seahorses, you can't even begin to understand how dirty they really can get. They, every single time they eat, they let a little bit of food out their gills and a lot out the other end. So, it adds up quickly. So, the more water and the more room you have, the less maintenance you're going to have to do to keep it clean. So, ease of maintenance is a big deal when you're talking about the tank size. Also, organic buildup. The key to keeping seahorses healthy is to make sure that things don't build up. So when you have 30 gallons for two seahorses, it takes a lot longer for all of their waste coming out both ends to build up. So we've got ease of maintenance, we've got less organics or longer period of time for the organics to build up. And then of course you have to realize that if something does go wrong with one of the seahorses, God forbid, then the, the closer they are in proximity to each other, the more likely it is that they're going to give that problem to each other, whether it be bacterial, parasitic, or whatever. If one gets sick and he's right next to the other one, he can pass it a lot easier than if they have their own territories. Speaking of territories, the next reason for 30 gallons per, per pair of seahorses is that they have territories. Whether you have a pair or two males, two females, it doesn't matter. They like to have space. Now, you'll see in most of my videos where they're jumping all over each other, and, and that does depend on the species. Different species have different behaviors. But either way, seahorses like to have time when they can get away from the rest and have their little me time. In a smaller tank, they won't have that ability, and it will stress them out. They're leading to disease. <laughs> so, again, ease of maintenance, lower organics, Diseases aren't as passed as quickly or as easily. They get their own territories and their own space so they're not as stressed out and hitching on each other and driving each other nuts all the time. And then finally, they also recommend that the taller the tank, the better. They recommend that you go at least three times the height of the adult in the species that you choose. Well, I there are a lot of reasons why that is. We're not gonna go into details, but I'm telling you right now that one of my erectus, my first erectus in fact that I got four years ago, was about four inches when I got a little teeny cutie. He's now over 10 inches, gigantic, and if he was in a 20 gallon tank, it would be disastrous. So they will need the room, even if they don't look like it at first, they're going to need that height and that width to move around. The next reason that you want 30 gallons per tank is for water movement. The smaller the tank, the harder it is to get your flow correct and to make sure that the oxygen exchange is proper. The final reason that you want to make sure that you have 30 gallons minimum per pair is because it's more space to hang equipment. Now, I prefer sumps, but if someone was not able to do a sump, um, college students, something like that, you want to have more area in which to hang filtration that we'll talk about in a minute. And so area to hang things is really important. So now that we've got our 30 gallon minimum per pair tank, we need to look at what's put in it. Substrate. With substrate, I'm going to tell you that I prefer to do always bare bottom. The reason is that it's easier for maintenance, um, when you feed seahorses, you do not want any leftover food to stay in the tank because it can build up and cause all sorts of problems. So with bare bottom, I can see the food more easily and take care of it and clean it more easily. But 
a lot of people really, really have gorgeous sanded tanks. So I'm actually doing one, and we will do a future video on it. But I'm going to do a very thin sand substrate because you want to stay away from the crushed coral and the gravel, the larger gravel type substrates, because as I was just saying, you don't want uneaten food to build up in the tank, and you don't want bacteria and organics to build up in the tank. And that's exactly what happens if you have larger gravel pieces, the bacteria in between, the food gets caught in between, it becomes a mess. So always stick with bare bottom or a thin sand substrate. So now we talk about filtration. Filtration is extremely important because it's what keeps our tanks safe so that there's no ammonia or nitrite or organics building up and hurting our seahorses. We have to remember though that the filtration for a seahorse tank is going to need to be very, very good because seahorses eat two to four times a day and that is going to make quite a bio load. So for filtration in a seahorse tank, we need to look at two different types. The two types are biological and mechanical. The biological filtration is your live rock or cycled rock or any porous media that holds bacteria that will perform the nitrogen cycle. And the bacteria actually eats organics and things that and converts the ammonia to nitrite to nitrates and keeps the tank cycled and safe. It doesn't really matter which filtration or which type you use, you could use rock, you could use um, porous media, you could use K1, you, they've got new bricks out. There are all sorts of porous media that you can use to hold the bacteria which will perform the biological filtration. The type is not important. The importance is having enough. The way that one of the ways that you can test your tank to make sure that your tank is fully cycled and you have enough biological filtration before adding seahorses is to add ammonia. Yes, I said ammonia. Sounds crazy, right? You don't want to do that with seahorses in the tank, but in the tank before you add seahorses, you can add ammonia up to 2 ppm, and it should convert to zero ammonia and nitrites by the next day. If you did dose 2 ppm of ammonia, and the next day you got an ammonia or nitrite reading, then you know that your tank is not fully cycled and you need to up your biological uh, filtration. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that if they put enough live rock and sand in their tank or media that will hold the biological filtration, that they're good. They're not. We need to have that me um, mechanical filtration also to remove the particulate matter. Up to me. This is my monster skimmer that's going on the 90 gallon. I'm very excited. Can't wait to set that one up on video too. To be, or to be coming soon, I guess what I meant to say. Anyways, the best form of mechanical filtration for a seahorse tank is gonna be your skimmer. It not only removes suspended material, but it also helps oxygenate. It has a lot of benefits. You can look them up, but I'm telling you now, every single seahorse tank should have a skimmer. Period. Then, of course, you have the other mechanical filtration, like either a floss or either floss in a hob filter or a sock at the beginning entrance to your sump. Something that is going to stop the big pieces of waste that are floating around, so that the bacteria can do its job. So, mechanical filtration helping the biological, and you'll be set. So again. The type of filtration isn't what really matters when you're setting up a seahorse tank. Having enough is the point. You want to make sure that your tank is fully cycled and has enough biological filtration in your rock, porous media, etc. to be macros actually too are a form of biological filtration. You want to make sure you have enough of that to cover the heavy bio load of seahorses and then make sure that you have that additional mechanical filtration skimmer, sump socks, floss, those types of things to help the biological and make sure that your complete filtration picture is perfect. 
The only other thing I'll mention is that I do prefer sumps because you can put your algae scrubber or any other extras that you want to help you with maintenance and filtration in a sump. Flow is one of the most important and yet least understood aspects of a seahorse tank. I'm actually going to read you a comment on one of the posts in one of the seahorse groups on Facebook because I just like it so much. It helped me understand flow. So, Abby Underwood of Seahorse Source said, you want good circulation in your aquarium, enough to remove excess organics. Just turning up the flow may not have the effect that you want or it might even make the environment stressful. I've personally experienced that. If you have way too much flow, then what can happen is the seahorses won't be able to swim around. Having the flow broken up to reach most of the areas of your aquarium will, will provide a healthier environment. You have to make sure there's no dead spots or you're gonna get algae and you're gonna get buildup and you're gonna have organics wreak havoc. Anyhow, back to Abby. Picture leftover food in your sink that you want to go down the drain. Turning up the water flow with the water faucet remaining stationary does little or nothing to get rid of the excess food and can cause an even greater mess by splashing it around. It is better to use a combined means, like using the spray bar to get the food down the drain in addition to the faucet. You don't want the aquarium under hurricane conditions, but the problem is that it is documented all over the internet that seahorses need really slow flow, so many of the aquariums that keep them do not have proper circulation. Really, really well said. I love that analogy. Basically, what it means is that the usual guideline, 10 to 20 times turnover rate, is no longer acceptable. It does still need to be 10 to 20 times turnover rate, but it should be through combined methods. So, for instance, if you had a 30-gallon aquarium with two seahorses in it, and you would want to aim for 300 to 600 gallon per hour turnover rate, you would want to do that through combined methods. So you would get, say, a 400 gallon per hour pump if you're using a sump, or, and you have to remember that if you do use a sump and a pump, that it loses some of its gallon per hour coming on, coming on up. So go with 400 gallon per hour pump for your sump, or if you're using a hob, get one that's rated three to 400 gallons per hour, and then add a covered wave maker, power head, some sort of flow maker that's rated anywhere from two to 300 gallons per hour. You do have to play with it. I mean, if you put them in and the seahorses can't swim, obviously it needs to be adjusted. But leaving the aquarium without enough flow is one of the biggest mistakes you'll make. My seahorses, I've shown repeatedly in my videos, actually flow dance. They love flow. They go swim into it. I have seahorses that sleep hitched to the power heads. Now, when I say power heads, I mean I keep them covered and the seahorses hitched to the cover. But they sleep hitched to the flow, bopping around, loving every minute of it. They don't want to be sitting. In fact, my original seahorses, my original seahorse tank, I tried to do very low flow. And I got cyano, and I got all sorts of bad algaes messing up my macros. And the seahorses didn't really move around much. They just kind of sat. As soon as I added a power head cover, they were all over the place, swimming, happy, and loving it. So make sure that you're giving your 10 to 20 times turnover rate through combined methods. As far as equipment, I've already mentioned that a skimmer is vital and crucial to have in the seahorse tank. But there are additional things that you're going to need. If you're going to do no sum, then you're going to want to use a hob filter. There are canisters. I'm going to do an extra video just to show you why I do not like canisters any longer. But if you are going to use a canister, make sure that you clean it often and make sure that you never have a case where it has to be turned off because the bacteria can die very quickly and make a mess. But hop filters will work for smaller tanks that don't have a sump 
and they provide a lot of surface agitation, which is good and important, and you can hold your media in the chamber, of course, any kind of floss, mechanical filtration, and chemical if needed for, for whatever reason. So pop, sump, or canister if you really want to do that, but I'm telling you, <laughs> pop or sump is what you want to go with. The other forms of equipment that are important are, of course, a UV sterilizer. That can come later, but I'm telling you, it will help the seahorse tank. My personal opinion, though, is that every seahorse tank should have a sump. You just have more room to add things like an algae scrubber if you want. And I will be doing a separate video on the algae scrubber because I think it has helped my tank in so many ways. It deserves its own video. Another excellent helper to a seahorse tank would be a refugium filled with macroalgae on a reverse light cycle. A sump will require that you have a pump to return the water to the tank and an overflow box to pull the water to the sump if your tank is not pre-drilled. You need to be sure to cover all of your wave makers and equipment. And don't forget the hitches! A lot of new seahorse keepers add a feeding dish to their tank, which is perfectly acceptable and actually good in some cases, but make sure that you buy one that does not have to stay in the tank at all times. They need to be cleaned or they'll become an organic nightmare. Let us not forget the most important equipment, the cleanup crew. Not only are the cleanup crew awesome for doing such a good job at helping us remove waste, but they can also be added to the tank before the seahorses. As long as your tests say that the ammonia and nitrite are zero, adding the cleanup crew first can tell you if there's some problem that maybe the tests don't detect. feeding time right now? No. Okay, so lighting is actually an easy topic to, for seahorse tank because it doesn't really matter if you're doing just seahorses only or plastic plants or a regular tank. In fact, I would encourage people to use an LED because it creates less heat and it still looks pretty and anything that's lower in wattage and in strength it's going to create less algae in the tank and on the seahorses and you know will still look good so a low powered led is probably best for a seahorse only tank now if you get into the macro algaes we're talking something else here i'll show a little clip of my sv reef light but i just wanted to show you real quick it's really cool i can actually change the spectrum I can make the tank look completely different in so many ways. And then I, of course, can adjust the, the volume of each channel. There's two different channels that affect the plants in different ways and grow in different ways. And I've got it set up to where it goes through a cycle like it was actually in the ocean and under real light, under sunlight. So it's really cool. 
I do like my light, but if you want to do seahorses only, get the low light LED. If you want to do macros, get a plant light that will grow plants or macros. And then if you're gonna do coral, make sure that you have something to support them too because the last thing you need is for coral or macros dying on you and creating more organics and more waste. I've done a couple of different videos on this channel so far about treating illnesses and treating bacterial illnesses. Well, that is the main reason that we keep our tanks at a certain temperature. A lot of people will say, wait a minute, seahorses come from tropical climates or whatnot. Well, sure, they do. The reason that we want to keep the tanks below 74 degrees is because the bacteria that can hurt them cannot survive as well under 74 degrees. The higher the temperature, the easier it is for those bad bacteria like Vibrio to take over and hurt the seahorses. Keeping the temperature low does a couple of different things. It slows things down as far as bacteria is concerned and it just feels good. Who doesn't want to sit in cool water? I'm kidding, but stop. So before you even start planning and setting up your seahorse tank, you have to make sure that you're willing to take care of them. They are not as hard as people say, but you do have to follow the guidelines and do things the right way in order to keep them alive and happy. Most people think that seahorses only live for about a year or two. They can actually live up to 12 years. If you're keeping proper maintenance, and keep, keep making sure that they're taken care of, they can live a very long time and grow very large. One of the biggest issues that people have with seahorses is their feeding schedule. They need to eat two times minimum, more like three or four times a day. Feeding a seahorse is a really important part of keeping them happy and healthy. We want to feed the uh, seahorses frozen mysis two to four times a day, and you need to make sure that your mysis is good. A lot of times when they, the frozen foods are shipped to your stores and such, they'll thaw out. And the second that they're thawed, they start decomposing, bacteria starts getting on top. I mean, it's dead food, come on. And so you wanna make sure that it looks white, it looks like it has never been unfrozen, and then when you get it home, you want to make sure that you keep it frozen. I would also recommend rinsing the mysis. I use a brine shrimp net and rinse it under tap water. That gets rid of any preservatives or anything like that. So a new keeper should not be trying to get live foods because you want to get them accustomed to eating the frozen food. But once they are accustomed to eating two to four times a day of the frozen mysis, then giving them a live treat that's enriched gives them that extra little bump that they don't get from frozen foods. Dance Feed with Probiotics has a lot of benefits and we'll learn more about that soon, but any, any enrichment you prefer would work. As far as tank mates go, I will put a link in the comments that will lead you to a page that will show you the level of risk for every fish and coral that you might want to put into a seahorse tank. And that's what it really boils down to is your risk tolerance level. You see, if you're like me and you are a zero and your main concern is the seahorses and what you care about is them being happy and healthy and aren't willing to risk a fish bringing in a pathogen or a coral bringing in aptasia or a fish eating all the food, then you don't add anything except for seahorses and snails like me. But there's nothing wrong with all of the beautiful tanks that I've seen that do have some fish and coral. It's always, it depends completely on the individual fish and the individual seahorses. Behaviors do play a part in this because I've seen multiple tanks that look really pretty with clownfish swimming around seahorses, but I wouldn't put my clownfish that are in my reef anywhere near my seahorses. My clownfish bite. They eat like crazy. I know my seahorses would starve if they were with them. And they're just, they're jerks, they're bullies. I wouldn't chance it 
for anything. So, quarantine again will help because you can tell if a new fish or coral is sick or bringing in something. And also you can tell his, its behaviors and see if it might be a good mix with your seahorses before adding them and then having a tragedy. There's nothing wrong if you want to have coral and fish in your tank. Just understand that there is risk associated with each thing. I would also advise any new seahorse keeper to definitely stick to snails and seahorses. That goes for species only. Just like I said to wait on the tank mates and coral, especially if your risk tolerance level is low, like mine. Um, with species, it's recommended that you keep only one species, at least at first. There are advances being made that may help us be able to keep lots of different things with seahorses, but as a new seahorse keeper, you need to get to know your seahorses before trying other things and venturing into new areas. The first, the original reason that people said not to mix species is because they were coming from different waters for a while. And a cold water seahorse and a warm water seahorse would have different resistance to different pathogens. They already have really crappy immunity. So when you put them together, they couldn't handle each other's pathogens and one species would die or both. It's a lot better now that we have captive breeding programs, but you have to consider, even, even in a breeder's tank, they're in different waters, they're in different tanks. There could be something wrong in this water and not in this one. So there's just always a risk when you're mixing different species. The other reason is because of behaviors. I have four different species in my house right now, and you couldn't pay me enough money to put my barbori with my erectus, because my erectus are like little teenage boys and they jump all over each other and they are all over the tank and rambunctious and crazy. My Borbori are petite and they act like, well, like little rich snooty people and they want their food fed to them properly and if somebody jumped on them they would most definitely stress. Now I know there are people that keep them together, I know that there are people that keep many species together. This video is for new seahorse keepers, and I'm advising you to stick to one species, at least until you know them, know the risks, and can make your own decisions based on your knowledge. The parameters in a seahorse tank need to be zero ammonia and nitrites. They can't handle any, and you need to make sure that the tank is fully cycled before you put the seahorses in. And then you should be doing weekly water changes to not only remove any excess nitrates and organics, but also to replenish nutrients that are lost to the skimmer or to the basic function of the tank. So weekly water changes. And then also I personally test my tank and a new keeper should test their tank often to make sure that you're keeping that zero ammonia nitrites and then, of course, you would do water changes or whatever to handle if you had any. If you see the seahorses acting up, that's when you might want to start testing things like pH and alkalinity and things like that. But for the basic, for the most part, you just want to make sure that your ammonia and nitrites stay zero, weekly water changes to keep the nitrates under control, and you should be good. A quarantine tank can be extremely simple. The complexity of it depends on what you're trying to do. Some people use a quarantine tank just to observe new fish and plants and coral to make sure that there's no hitchhikers that they don't want coming in. Others will use a quarantine tank to actually pre-treat new seahorses before adding them to the tank. With seahorses, a quarantine tank is especially important because it gives them a chance to de-stress and start eating properly before being put into the main tank. My final note is that I would advise anyone to buy captive bred seahorses from a reliable seahorse breeder. Not only is that helping with conservation of the wild, but 
it will be so much easier on you. I have been breeding seahorses and I can tell you that weaning a seahorse onto frozen foods is no fun. It's very difficult and you're not always successful. You're much better off buying a captive bred seahorse that's already weaned on frozen foods, is used to tank life so it won't be all stressed out because it can't understand why it's in a box, and will just be much less likely to have any bacterial or parasitical issues that you might find from a wild caught seahorse. So, now that we've gone through all the guidelines, let's summarize real quick because I do tend to go on and on. To set up a seahorse tank, which we will be doing on film for you to actually see me set this tank up and the 90 gallon, but if you're already ahead of me, then you want to make sure that you have 30 gallon minimum per pair, taller tank is better, you want to try to get at least three times the height of the adult in the species that you choose. You want to make sure that you have a thin sand or bare bottom substrate. Your filtration, you need to make sure that the um, biological and mechanical filtration is enough to handle a heavy bio load of seahorses eating two to four times a day. As a new seahorse keeper, you should stick to one species only in the tank and not mix other species and try to stick to either no other fish and coral or go by the guidelines listed in the comments and make sure that you don't add anything that's going to eat the food too fast where the seahorses starve or hurt the seahorses. Things like hard corals and such will die when the seahorses hitch on them and just create a whole bunch of mess for you. So I'm really advising new seahorse keepers to stick to one seahorse species and snails. Remember that seahorses do not need low flow and that using a combined method will provide adequate thro flow throughout the tank. Make sure to cover all wave makers or power heads and any intakes. Be sure to provide plenty of hitches so the seahorses feel safe and secure. Feed the seahorses two to four times a day with frozen mysis. The lighting should reflect what's in the tank but a low light LED is best for seahorses only for less heat. Make sure you have a skimmer somewhere in, the, in or on the tank. The temperature must remain under 74 degrees. Test often to be sure that the tank is safe and cycled. And always keep in mind that seahorse keepers are at different skill levels and different risk tolerance levels. A breeder or experienced seahorse keeper can do things that a new seahorse keeper should definitely not. The guidelines are here to help you keep your seahorses alive and healthy while you get to know them and their personalities and figure out their needs.